It is Wednesday afternoon. It is January 5th, 2022. We are so glad to be back and to be together since we weren't raptured. <laughs> we'll look forward to uh, that yet in God's timing. But we are going to pick up at day five of creation. We've looked at the first four days really quite well. We're just going to review real quickly that we know Bereshit, Bara, Elohim, and I can even keep going because you all learned your Hebrew so well, but just to suffice it for right now, in the beginning, God's created. We saw that, that all three personalities of our triunity were involved in creation. We saw that God created Bara. Um, it, it was a new creation, a fresh, it was a, a created uh, well, we know it was the world that he created, the heavens and the earth, because that's what he tells us. Usually we say bara means out of nothing, and we know that the earth was created out of nothing, that God just brought it into existence. Then we began to see a little more of the detail of it, and we saw that before the first day, we had the, the spirit moved over the waters, and we saw that there was light. We talked about how it was not the sun, but there was light, because there was light that meant that there was also a darkness, and there was this separation, the darkness being separated from the night, I mean, from the day, so he called the darkness night, and he called the light day. And that was our first day. We've just gone through five verses in about 30 seconds. We're doing well. <laughs> and then we see that on the second day, the firmament or the expansion is what was brought into place at the dry land uh, called earth. The gathering of the waters called sea. We saw that, that God said it was good. All the way through, God says that, that his creation is good. That's an interesting point we'll pick up for a reason a little later. But we go on from there to see the sprouting of the vegetation. I think that's on third day, though. It is. I'm sure it is. I'm looking for where second day was the firmament. Third day, we begin to see the earth, and we begin to see the vegetation on the earth. And in the fourth day, we saw the lights that we know as sun, moon, stars, and so forth being made. And we saw that each time we have different words in Hebrew, some that are telling us made out of nothing, some that are telling us they're fashioned in a new way, some that are uh, giving us the idea that time has passed. But nowhere do we see anything in all of our creation that allows that uh, other view of it being more than 24-hour days. We'll keep that in mind, especially when we get to the end to our day seven, but just refreshing our mind by bringing that up right now. So we've gone all the way through the fourth day, that's verse 19, and we've seen what's been created, and now on our fifth day, picking up at verse 20, we're going to see that we're talking about the animal life, and that's going to be on several levels, but we'll take that as it comes. So we look right away and we have the first three words are critically important. Then God said. We don't have any room for God putting evolution into existence and turning his creation over to evolution to evolve and to come to a different state. It's all God. It's all God. It's God saying. It's God doing what God says is done. We know that. So... In verse 20, God said, let the waters teem with swarms of living creatures. Now, you may have let it bring forth abundantly. Uh, it may talk about the moving creature that has life. I'm giving you different <clears throat> versions that are said. But when we look at the Hebrew, really that swarming word is the, the closest word. And I get a kick out of, let the waters swarm with the swarmers. <laughs> That's pretty close to what the Hebrew tells us. And those swarmers uh, have a soul of life. That means that's the part where we're saying in our English of living creatures. It's saying it's life. It's alive. And I guess I like swarm, swarmers that are swarming because that makes me see them swimming and, you know, doing what all they're teeming. And they're teeming with life. And I think that's why I, I got a kick out of it when I saw it. But it's very interesting because this does not indicate evolution of life evolving out of the water either. This is in the water. These are the things that God has created in the water that he's talking about. Uh, but it goes on past the waters also because he says, let the birds fly above the earth in the open expanse of the heavens. So we're going to go on and we're going to see that there's more created than just one species at this time. And by the way, some translations have translated the moving creature 
as creeping things. So if you're seeing that in your scripture, that's what we're talking about. The, the moving creatures, these creatures that have a life in them, some creep, some are, there's marine animals, there's invertebrates, there's vertebrates, that's the backbones and the no backbones, there's reptiles. Um, again, when the Hebrew comes into play and it talks about the, these living creatures, it will use the word tanon neem. That's probably doesn't mean anything to you other than tanon would be the singular, or tanin, and then, um, oops, I think that's an and. Uh, and then when we pluralize it in Hebrew, we put an I-M on the M. That's like equal to the S in English. So it goes from being one creature that he created to being multitude of creatures that he's created. So usually this word, when he talks about the tanin, what he's talking about is usually um, given the name serpent, dragon, sea monsters, that sort of thing. So we have in the waters the big, the whales, the sharks, you know, the big things been created, as well as the smaller. Um, it, I don't believe this means the serpent as in the, the one that appeared in the garden, the, the dry on the ground, but there are water serpents, you know, the, we've got all kinds of life. I just want us to see variety. I think that's what I'm trying to stress is variety. When we see how much variety is created, it tells us how great our God is to be able to think up and create all of these different uh, species of, of animals, not just within the, the, the one source, but others also, the tiny to the magnanimous. We've got the little guppy, and we've got the great shark, okay? And everything in between. It is amazing what God has created. And when he refers to water animals, I believe this is what he's referring to. He's going to refer to land animals on day six. We're going to see that's tomorrow. And I don't mean, I mean because we're on day five. You know, I mean that kind of tomorrow. Um, and the birds also, though, we see in today's, in day five. The, let the birds fly above the earth. And again, this is birds of every kind. And you've got everything from your little sparrows to your big eagles, and, and you've got the hawks, and you've got, you know, all kinds. What we're really beginning to see in God's order of creation is we're seeing we're going from what we consider the lesser forms of life to the greater forms of life. So we're going from... Um, the, the amoebas and all of that to the water animals, but then we're seeing that the birds really are more majestic there, we're told. Now, people who love the ocean animals are going to have issue with that, but science tells us this is the, the chain, okay? And they're, they're saying that as we follow God's order, then we go from the, the little to the water, to the birds now, then we're going to go to the animals on land, and ultimately to man's creation. That order is anything but the evolutionary process, and that's all that I want to stress out of it, is God's order has nothing to do with evolving into a better form and a better shape and a change. And it's also interesting to notice that it doesn't sound in all of this, especially when you have swarmers swarming and you have all the birds and all that I'm saying, God did apparently didn't just make a single pair of each kind. It sounds like he made an abundance, that there was an abundance. And when I think about how much water covers, you know, the earth, the seas, the, the fishies that we see in California, they don't see in Florida let alone go to the Red Sea or go to the Asian Sea, the Mediterranean Sea. You know, so I can see God was teeming it all with, with life. Whether it was all closer together or not doesn't matter. You get my point. Um, everything's very rich in species, in, in, I don't know the words, genara, however you say the word, but the idea is that, that there's such a richness of variety. I know that when I've had the opportunity to be at one of the fourth richest places in the world of water life, it's in the Red Sea, 
and they have an aquarium there to show you all that's in that area and it is phenomenal. You walk around, I did anyway, with my mouth dropped wide open and you would see even in, in tanks what you would think that you finally have seen all the fish that are moving in that tank and suddenly what you thought was fauna, what you thought was background, suddenly swims away <laughs> and it is in a different shape. It's in the shape of a box or the, the shape of, of a triangular something or other, or, you know, I mean, it's just amazing what God put in. And this is where they were created. This is not evolution. This is not a step, you know, oh, well, it changed like this. Evolution tells you the giraffe didn't originally have a long neck. It got a long neck because it had to reach for its food over millions of years. And so the neck grew a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more as it had to keep reaching and reaching and reaching for food. And I always wanted to question, but, you know, I never heard it personally, I could question, but I always wanted to say, well, if the neck, you know, learned to grow, how did it tell that baby that was born to start with the neck its length and keep growing from there? And why is a baby giraffe today grown, uh, born with a long neck then, you know? That does not make sense. It's, it's not been necessary, and yet it's still there, so... Just little sidelights, but the water animals, the fowls, they were endowed with power to multiply, to be fruitful and multiply. This is divine blessing. And pardon me, I have a bit of sinus drainage today. That's all that's going on with me. But uh, um, God didn't design reproduction after sin as a fact that, okay, now we got a problem, now we got to go different. No, God said be fruitful and multiply before sin ever entered this world. That was his intention, was new life, new growth, and blessing that comes along with it. Uh, numbers would increase. It would, it would not be an ending, it would be a continual growing. Again, when we see uh, that it talks about all of them, I guess, do I want to move into verse, no, I won't move quite into verse 20. One yet, but let me just remind you where I talked about the life of the living creature. That also is speaking of a consciousness of life. Plants are alive, but they don't have that um, living creature part given to them when the description of the plants were made. Remember, the plants have already been made. They were made on day three. Uh, but this is a time when th those things that are aware of life are are when it, are being born, that they, they have a um, consciousness of it. I don't know any other way to put it. Okay, hopefully I'm communicating. I feel like I'm fumbling, but hopefully I'm communicating. Uh, let's look at the, the fact that it says that, that all the birds that fly above the earth, the ones that were created at this point are the ones that are in the open expanse of the heavens or the open firmament of the heavens. That, in the Hebrew, is saying on the face of the expanse. What it's telling us is it's telling us that it's talking about the birds that we see, the birds that, that fly in our sky, that it's not talking about all the way to where the sun and the moon and the stars are. It's right here on the face of this expansion that these birds are flying through our open air. And that's what has just been created in verse 20, going on to verse 21. God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves. We're getting this detail again a little bit more. The word created here in verse 21 is bara. This is the original creation. It's not that they pre-existed. This is when this type of life started. And only God can give that life the ability to have that living soul that brought it alive so that it, it could swim and it could fly and it can do what it does. And again, it totally um, gives no room for a, an evolutionary time, a process of time. Um, okay, uh, I think I've told us um, every living creature, what am I saying here? Um, oh, okay, see, this, this is what evolution wants to claim, that the, that the creatures that are like the marine organisms, that they came before the plant life. But remember, we've already got that plant life. It was on day three. So 
we've got the order that does not follow what evolution says it has to have for evolution to work. And yet they want us to believe and accept that. These living creatures that God, God has created in verse 21, he says that moves again, creeping, moving, have, you know, ability to, to get around. And notice now for all of these that he's talked about that he's created, he says, um, oh, well, I, and I should read it for us, with which the water swarmed after their kind and every winged bird after its kind. And then God's going to say that it's good, but what does it mean after their kind? What's God now spelling out? He's told us, I've created all of these that you see in the water. I've created all that you see in the sky. And I've created each after their kind. What he is saying is he's saying that they had within them that what we call today the DNA that programs who you are. You know, your DNA is who you are. That's all within them, so that a bird never gives birth to a fish. And a fish doesn't produce a cat. And a, a, a cat doesn't produce a snake. <laughs> okay, I'm just trying to think of different. There's no room to cross to anything else. Evolution is insistent upon that, that you evolve into another form. But God said that he gave them the ability to produce after their kind so that there's a wide range of different details within that kind. You've got a great Dane and you got a little teacup poodle. <laughs> Again, in the waters, you've got your guppies and you've got your sharks and your whales. You have all kinds of variety but it's all within the same. A fish is a fish, a bird is a bird, a dog is a dog, a cat is a cat. An elephant will have a baby elephant. Uh, that's just the way God programmed it, and that's what he's saying here. They will produce after their kind. You don't have any crossovers. And God saw that it was good, but he doesn't just stop there. I love that, it, that he tells us his creation is good. We see that. We know that. We agree. But notice the next in verse 22. God blessed them. God loves his creation. And he blessed his creation. The animals are the object of God's care and concern also. And we know we read that because go with me to Matthew chapter 6 and verse 26. Matthew 6 and verse 26. And we read there in verse 26. Come on, get out of my way. Thank you. Verse 26. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow, nor reap, nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? So our heavenly Father is feeding the birds in the air. If you're feeding someone, you're caring for them. You love them, and we see this here. Go also to chapter 10 in Matthew. Chapter 10 and verse 29. Just a few pages over for you. Matthew 10, verse 29. And there we read, Are not two sparrows sold for a cent? And yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. That means God knows when a sparrow falls. Sparrow is just a little bird. There are many sparrows. Anyone could possibly say, oh, well, that's just one of a multitude. What does it matter? But that's not God's attitude. He blessed that little sparrow. He has fed that sparrow, and he knows when that sparrow's life has come to an end. Um, this, this is God's love in action, and we know how much more he cares for us than even these little precious created living creatures that have that, that soul, that, that living awareness that they have. Going back to Genesis, we'll go back to verse 24. And, whoops, I'm having to fight commercials on my tablet. Okay, um, no, did I do, I didn't do 23. Don't let me skip 23. There was evening and there was morning a fifth day. So now we have our fifth day of creation accomplished. We have all these living new species to enjoy. Then we're going to move on to our next day. So um, verse, I've lost my place. Verse 24. 
Then God said, again, God, 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 he is the one orchestrating, creating, doing. That's all there is. No substitute. It's God. Then God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures after their kind. So the waters now have brought forth living creatures. Now the earth is going to be bringing forth living creatures after their kind. And before I explain those living creatures, let me tell you the Hebrew word here again gives that soul of life. That these are creatures that have a consciousness of life. It will distinguish them again from the plants which grow but have no consciousness of life. Animals have souls. Now everybody is going to jump on that and say, then do they have to be saved? And, well, when we talk about soul, that is the conscious awareness of life. It's the spirit that we come to know the Lord in spirit and in truth. So we're not talking about uh, that they have to be God conscious and that they needed to have a right relationship with their creator. We're not saying that. That's what we say about man because man is body, soul, and spirit that we're seeing the animals at their body and soul. And as soon as I say that and I stop there, there are people that then worry about, well, you know, do I get to see my pets in heaven? And all this comes into, you know, our, our thought processes. And let me just make it very clear to us. We're trying to understand a majestic God who is created beyond our comprehension that we are spending a lifetime discovering what he has created and how wonderfully he created, we don't begin to understand all of its fullness. But we know that God loves those little animals that he's given you to love. He loves them also and cares for them. I don't have any problem with them being in heaven. I cannot say, here's scripture and verse, but I, I, I tell you, there's no problem if they are, and if they are not, I guarantee you will not grieve that when you're there. And if it comforts you to believe it now, so be it. Be comforted, because God is a God of love, and God is a God who cares. So, you know, it, it's the criteria is, man puts all these complications on it. For man to enter heaven, we know. You have to have that that um, spirit, that the spirit that... Um, recognizes sin and receives salvation, we're not talking about that. Um, we're just talking about how he created these animals to be aware of life. And that's what we're saying here. If you want to see how man is body, soul, and spirit, look up 1 Thessalonians 5.23 later on your own, because it refers to man there being body, soul, and spirit. It oh, is, is that 1 Thessalonians, it's on your... your oh. 5.23. It should be on the end of verse 24 on your cross references. Genesis 8? 50, no, 1 Thessalonians 5.23. Okay, okay, 24. Okay. Yeah. I'll tell you what. I'll read it anyway. I was going to not, but I think I'm losing more time by not than I would have if I read it. 1 <laughs> Thessalonians 5, verse 23, and we read there... Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So that's what man is made up of. Man is a triunity also, body, soul, and spirit. And uh, the animals, we're told, our body and soul, we're not seeing the spirit part in them, but we know still God gave them life, and God loves them and cares for them. Um, the living creatures of the earth are distinguished from the sea monsters. Um, verse 21, that shows that the animals, those animals evolved, uh, not I'm going to use the word evolved, I'm sorry, those animals were created in the water. Now we're looking at animals that are created on the land. I think I already said that, but let me just make sure that that is clear. And again, evolution is going to say first you had insects, then you had amphibians, then you had land reptiles, then you had birds, and again, this is not God's order. So in my opinion, Satan took everything of God's order and flipped it in another way and gave a counterfeit. And Well, I shouldn't call it counterfeit because it's not like counterfeit bills look good, but gave a totally different order. If man would just listen to God, here's our origin, here's how it all began, and again, no room for an evolutionary process that we were once swinging from our tails or 
slime on a riverbank that came to life. Okay? So, back in Genesis 1 and verse 24 still, we see that, uh, that God's told the earth now to bring forth living creatures, bring forth their bodies were composed of the same elements of the earth, okay? That's why animals, when they die, will go back to the dust of the ground, the same as we know man, and we'll talk about that when we get to man. But uh, verse 25 is going to talk about these animals. It's going to say God made. This is the, a different word than bara. In verse 25, this is asa again, the A-S-A-H -A in our Hebrew. But it's the asa, it's the same thing when God first made the sun. Um, in our realm, he used that word. Does not mean that these animals existed somewhere else? But he didn't create them out of nothing. He created them out of the earth is what, what we're saying. They're made up of the same um, elements as the earth. And they'll go back to the elements of the earth when they, they die. We're talking about the, the bodies. Okay, and again, he made them, we're told in verse 24, that he made them uh, after their kind. Okay, so cattle and creeping things, beasts of the earth after their kind. The same way that that whale is going to give birth to a baby whale, and that's a miraculous birth, by the way, if you don't know that, study it, Google it sometime and find that out, because it's only God that can make it work. <laughs> but now we're going to look at the land animals, and that they also going to produce after their own kind. They're not going to produce after some other kind. A monkey is not going to give birth to a lion, and a lion is not going to give birth to a gorilla. You're not going to see any crossover. The fossils that we have through all time always show the same. They do not show there is no fossil proof of a transition from one form over to another form. Yet evolution that says that there has to be this period of time for all these changes to take effect, then there should be fossils showing something caught in between that was in that process of changing but didn't get its whole time and didn't make it. And yet there is none of that. Fossils are always one complete species. You don't have anything in between. Let me take that into our human body and I'll get more complicated probably later. We'll see depending on time. But right now, let me just talk about our eye. The formation of our eye. If evolution were right for that eye to evolve into an eye, there's 40 different stages of evolution that would have to take place. Each would be just a slight modification, which is what evolution says. Just one little change, one little change, one little change. There'd have to be 40 stages to bring the eye into being an eye that works as it does. Now, Look at the liver, and look at the kidney, and look at the heart. Look at these complex organs. Look at how many times would they need just one little change, one little change, one little change to evolve to come into being a liver, to come into being a heart, to come into being an eye. And the absolute audacity of believing that that could all come together at the right time, that liver become a liver, when the eye becomes an eye in a human being all at one time. Well, the author I was reading said, <laughs> take an old watch, throw it at the wall, and expect a brand new, better watch to fall. And that's your chance of the evolutionary process doing that for the human being. Okay? God made us fearfully. God made us wonderfully. God made the animals fearfully and wonderfully. And I've offered the, 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 to, to tell you about the book before, uh, If Animals Could Talk by Werner Gitt, G-I-T-T. -T. And Roger, I'm going to let you write that down for them. Um, I want to read to you. Um, I, I'll either read one or two depending on how fast this goes, how hard it is for you just to listen. But just an idea. The book it tells us how creation speaks for itself. It tells us how wonderfully they're created, but it does it from the viewpoint of each animal that it talks about for each chapter. So this is just talking about that field sparrow. Since I taught you, read to you about a sparrow falling, 
that not one falls without God knowing. We listen to the field sparrow. It is true that there are quite a lot of us, field sparrows speaking. Our song is loud and not very appealing. People think we eat their crops. Even our humble appearance doesn't earn us any admirers. But still, if you take the trouble to pay attention to a cheeky sparrow, you'll find it worthwhile. I promise you that. By the way, I didn't know there were so many varieties of sparrows. But a sparrow gives birth to a sparrow, not to anything else. And yet there's variety within. You think you wouldn't find anything special about me, do you? Well, there are just as many of us as there are of you. You think that just because there's lots of something that makes it irrelevant, then you would have to be pretty unimportant yourself. Oh, excuse me, I was being really impertinent. Actually, I am a well-mannered field sparrow. I wouldn't want you to confuse me with my cousin, the fat and cheeky house sparrow. You can recognize me by my gray breast and a black patch on my wings, so you can easily tell us apart. As my, same as, as my name suggests, I tend to keep away from your houses. Live out in the field. I was born to fly. My creator designed me first and foremost as a flyer. For that reason, every last part of my body is designed for flight. I can't figure out how some people have the nerve to say that we descended from reptiles. Just imagine. Dinosaurs are supposed to be our closest relatives. Nobody can make me believe that the first sparrow lived more than 50 million years ago. It seems to me that that fairy tale character in this whole theory is camouflaged by the huge number of years. But let's leave that theory aside and concentrate on the facts. Then you can judge for yourself. My body is made of the lightest material imaginable. All of my bones are hollow. That means they can take, they can take to the air. They are very light, but they remain stable. A distant relative of mine, the albatross, has bones that have a combined weight of only 4.2 to 5.3 ounces, even though he's 39 inches long and has a wingspan of almost 10 feet. The weight of his feathers exceeds the weight of his bones. If our bones were full of marrow, like those of the reptiles, we could never fly. Besides that, our pelvis is attached to our spine, which is not the case with the reptiles. That's the only way our skeleton has the strength and elasticity that is essential for flying. God made him to fly. The small hole in the linkage of my upper arm bone seems pretty remarkable to me. This is not a defect. The ligament which connects the breast muscle with the upper side of the shoulder joint goes through this hole. Without this, I wouldn't be able to lift my wing, let alone fly. If I descended from reptiles, then I would have to ask myself, who drilled that hole in the cavity? Who threaded the ligament through the hole? You will look long and hard before you will find a hole like that in a crocodile or in a dinosaur. Squawk. Help a sparrow hawk. Squawk. Where can I hide? Help. Oh, I got away again. That was a close one. Now he's gone again. Did you know the sparrow hawk is our worst enemy? With his long claws, he can even grab us out of the thickest bush if we don't watch out. We've got a whole crowd of enemies, crows, magpies, cats, and humans. They don't even leave us alone at night. The owls grab us from the branches where we sleep. I remember one time when a horrible screech owl broke into our nest in the middle of the night, tore my husband out, and mercilessly ripped him apart from head to toe. It was terrible. Nevertheless, I know that my Creator cares for me. In the Bible, it says that God doesn't forget a single sparrow. It must be even better for you as you're much more valuable to him than I am. He's even numbered the hairs on your head. Yes, God obviously cares for you humans in a special way. You know, my Creator gave me an exceptionally strong heart. It's one of the most efficient hearts there are. At the moment, while talking to you, it's beating more than seven times a second or 460 times a minute. Just now, when I was fleeing from the sparrow hawk, my pulse went up to 760. It has to be that fast to enable me to fly. Yes, look at me more closely. Do you see my beak? Not, not very remarkable from the outside, right? But it is a miraculous tool which my Creator gave me. Super light and yet capable of the hardest tasks. Somebody figured out that the tearing length of the horn of my beak is about 20 miles. 
That means if you made a wire of this material and could fasten it somewhere, then the wire would only tear as the result of its own weight when it was longer than 50 miles. The material you humans use for your aircraft construction has a tearing length of just 11 miles. Did you know my entire skull is lighter than both my eyeballs? <laughs> that doesn't mean that you have to make nasty remarks about my bird brain. My eyes are far better than your eyes. We birds have seven to eight times more visual cells per unit of surface area than you have. That way, we have an image in our brains that is much sharper than yours. For example, if you wanted to see an object as clearly as a buzzard does, you would have to use an 8 by 30 telescope. I admit, my eyes are not quite so sharp, but I'm still sure they are much better than yours. A biologist wrote that my eye is a miracle of construction, function, and efficiency. It's one of the most perfect optical organs in the vertebrate in the vertebrate world, sorry. It has to be, because even when we are flying at our fastest, we can't afford to miss any important detail. And side note, I thought of the Hummer. I watched those hummingbirds at 90 miles an hour zip to the feeder and get their tiny little beak in that tiny little hole perfectly. I've never heard one miss the hole. The <laughs> it's always right in. And I realized that's their eyesight. Besides our sharp eyes, God's also given us a very flexible neck. It's so flexible we can reach every part of our body with our beak. Do you think that's just coincidence? You try touching your forehead to your knee while standing. Oh, so you can do it, can you? Hmm, no. No need to try right now. If you really can do it, you'll probably hear your bones cracking. For me, this flexibility is a matter of life and death. What did you say? God made me so that eating's all I'm good for? Well, my creator and I won't accept such an insult. Do you actually have any idea what I eat? Yep, yeah, that's what I thought. He who knows the least shouts the loudest. Oh, excuse me. I'm being cheeky again, but you weren't so polite yourself. In China, my relatives almost became extinct because certain people thought we field sparrows ate too much rice and millet. As they went through the process of almost exterminating our race, they realized that vermin were taking over their fields. Their losses were even higher than before. Our actual diet consists of small animals that you regard as pests, but which we treasure as delicacies. Cockchafers, I don't know how to say it, flying ants, larvae of the green oak leaf roller, apple blossom weevils, leaf lice, etc. <laughs> Speaking of eating, have you any idea as to how our digestion functions? Actually, it's quite an interesting topic. As you know, everything about me is geared to flight. Since I eat so much protein, I can get by with a very short intestine, but I need very powerful digestive juices. My creator didn't want to weigh me down with useless byproducts of digestion, so I drop the stuff out as fast as I can, often when I'm flying. I know I sometimes manage to decorate your clothing that way. I am terribly sorry. <laughs> my builder did something very ingenious when he made me. He omitted my bladder completely. That way, he is able to make my body more slender at the rear, which helps for streamlining and keeps my weight down. 80% of my urine consists of uric acid, which crystallizes into a white paste at the very end of my intestine. Isn't that a nifty solution? <laughs> Furthermore, almost all the water necessary for the excretory process is recovered into the organism, so I don't need to take up on water too often. It goes on and on. I think I'll stop there, but it goes on and on. It tells so much more how it's been created and, you know, I mean, how can evolution do that? Put that hole in and put the wing ligament through, you know, so that it can lift its wing and fly have that digestive system, the ability to see all of this that comes together in just a little field sparrow. And in the end, he says, um, there's so much more I could tell you about my lung system, the miracle of flight, the super construction of my feathers, my navigation system, but I'll leave that to my colleague, the swallow, who's much more of an expert on such matters. Just tell me this, do you still believe that I'm a descendant of some kind of creeping animal? No. My creator is neither coincidence nor millions of years. My creator is the one who spoke the word on the fifth day. 
that birds were to fly over the earth. He is the one who created all this after our kinds. He is the one who blessed us and delights in us. I am a miraculous work of his hands, and you too. We really ought to praise him together. That's just one little indication of what this book is chocked full of. If you like things like that, there's so much more. Um, let me give you titles real quick so you know some of the animals. Um, this was the bird brain, the field sparrow. It tells us about the whales, the platypus, the swallow, the glowworm, the dragonfly, the earthworm. It talks about the golden plover. That's an amazing one. And it also talks about uh, the human eye in the detail that I won't try to go into now because it is quite lengthy and quite detailed, but wow. That eye that we talked about just a bit ago of it taking these 40 different little changes to evolve to become an eye, then it wouldn't even work in the way that God made it all of a sudden. He didn't stretch it out. But you get my point, is God gives no room for the belief of evolution and of a process it's too amazing to believe that. I remember one of these whales that it talks about that is so heavy, and its tail fin is slightly turned. If it was straight on, the whale itself would drown. It would not be able to lift its weight and get up for air, and it would drown. It would, it, it, it would be non-existent. But because God twisted that tail, it's able to lift and to, to move. And again, they'll say, well, that was evolution. Well, how did it, the first one survive long enough? Why did they drown to get to the point of the evolutionary twist? We know, no, God's the one who twisted its tail. Um, need I say more? I hope you're as blessed by me of reading of the fascination of God's creation. He has made everything amazing. He, we, he tells us in Scripture, we're fearfully and wonderfully made. But I believe everything God created is fearfully and wonderfully made, and the detail is, is just amazing. So, looking at now, again, at these uh, land animals that we're looking at, we're going to go on into verse 25. We've got our sea and our air filled with living creatures. Now God's going to fill the earth. He's going to produce living beings on the earth after their kind. And we're going to see them in three categories, because now we're just going to talk about the... the um, land ones. We're going to talk about beasts, and when we talk about beasts, that's, I don't know if you're hearing it well, B-E-A-S-T-S, -S, beasts. Um, it's large animals like an elephant, lions, the wild animals, that's what we call the beasts. Okay? The cattle are the domesticated animals, and when we talk about the creeping animals, those are the smaller land animals which move either with or without feet. That'll be your reptiles, your insects, your worms, etc. All three of these categories are talked about in the land animals that God's creating from verse 25 on. So when it says God made the beasts of the earth in the beginning of verse 25, again, right now we're going to talk about the large mammals such as the elephant and the lion with with that phrase he made them after their kind and it was so and i lost my place okay made the beasts of the earth after their kind and the cattle after their kind and the, everything that creeps on the ground after its kind and god saw that it was good okay that's what i just explained to you the three categories uh, no, notice that each is given the divine word good uh, the blessing isn't set God didn't bless them individually. It's like he's in such a hurry to get all the way to man that he waits to put that blessing on until he's created man. But each part, God says it is good. And anything God does, we know it is good. Uh, the work of creation of man is going to be so different that I also believe that's why God's using a different way to say it in a different degree of meaning that we will find. Um, what I'm hinting at is he's going to say about man and man only that we will make man in our image after our likeness. Here he's created the animals and then they, cre they, they produce after their kind, but when it gets to the human, God says of that human that we're made in his image 
and after his likeness. Total difference. It's going to separate man from all the rest of creation, everything that we've been talking about up to this point. Okay? So, um, at this very outset, we've got creatures that I'm going to just put it this way. Everything else could be equal. Your sea animals, your birds, everything could be just considered equal. We're going to see that separation and that higher um, preeminence given to only man because man's made in God's image. Okay, so I think we've done verse 25. God saw that it was good. We're ready for verse 26. And guess how it starts? Do you know it by now by heart? Can you tell me the first three words? You should be able to. Then God said. <laughs> That's just the way it is. Okay, then God said, let us. Now, there are some other scriptures that give us an indication similar to this. Remember, this is the first. This is the first that, that's being written. This is in Genesis. But we have all the scripture to help us understand scripture. We have the end from the beginning, in other words. So do we see language like that? Is God suddenly introducing us, us to the idea that there's more than one God, as in totally separate and distinct gods, plural? Or is there something different in that us? I'm going to take you into other scriptures that talk about the us, and we're going to see that what is being proven to us gives no room for other gods, in plural, but for one God in the three persons. We're going to see the Father and the Son are equal. This move of the Spirit is in tune in part of the Father's will and the Son's actions. They're not three separate gods. They, we personify them in that way, that they're, they make up one. And that's what we're going to see from these other scriptures. So go with me to Psalm 2-7. And by the way, um, the verses that we're going to be looking at are excellent verses when you are sharing with a Jewish person who is of the belief that Christians do worship three gods and that nowhere in our Jewish Bible do we get an indication that God is any more than God. And yet, what do we do then with a psalm like Psalm 2? Psalm 2, for those who do know, who have studied, is known as the first Messianic Psalm, which means there are a number of Psalms that speak about the Messiah, this being the very first one. Didn't take them far. Out of 150, the second one, boom, we've already got it. Not wanting to read the whole Psalm, you can do that on your own later, but just know if you realize that speaking of Messiah will make much more sense to you, but how do we get that? Why can we say that? Well, look at verse 7. Verse 7 says, I, and it's God speaking, I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son, today I have begotten you. So God spoke to someone, said he's, he's his son, said that he's begotten him. That's first rank position. Who is he saying that to? Those of us who, who know that the, the truth of the whole of the scripture, we know that the Son is who we call Yeshua Jesus. That God was saying to Yeshua Jesus, your first rank in position of... Okay, how am I going to say it? Well, let me just take you down to verse 12 to, to show you what I'm trying to bring out, okay? Who is the Son that God says that, that he's declared and begotten him, that he's put him in first rank position with him. And we know the Lord is the first of all, of all human, that, that all belongs to him. He created all, is all for him, and it will all come to him. He is the heir that will receive everything that he created. Verse 12 says, do homage to the son. If you have the old King James, it says, kiss the son. Homage, kissing, that's showing worship and adoration. That's bowing down and worshiping this one. Do homage to the Son that he may not become angry and you perish in the way. You need to, to honor him, adore him, worship him, lest he become angry and decide to, to end your life. He has that ability, for his wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are all who take refuge in him. 
Now, who is our refuge and strength? God. God. So if we can take refuge in the Son, and we can take refuge in God, the two have to be one. And yet, they're able to talk to each other as if there are two. The Father said to the Son. Now, we know from Isaiah chapter 9, the Son was never born. The Son was given. The child was born. We just went through that because of Christmas. We should do that verse all year long. So it's good we're doing it in January. <laughs> this son, it refers to, when it talks about position in his human flesh, but we know this son always existed. So the one that we're to worship and do homage to then has to be God. And that's fitting because Scripture tells us repeatedly only God and Yeshua Jesus receives worship. The angels do not. Go to the book of Revelation, where John is amazed by what he is seeing. And he gets so excited, there's two different times that he bows down to the angel that's showing it to him. And the angel very quickly says, don't worship me, get up, <laughs> don't do that. Only God receives worship. This one we're being told to, commanded to worship. So obviously, the son of verse 7 that word of worship in verse 12 has to be God. So God and Yeshua have to be one. Look at Isaiah 48. Isaiah chapter 48. Yeshua chapter 48. Isaiah 48. And we're going to look at verses 16 and 17. Verses 16 and 17. Come near to me. Listen to this. From the first I have not spoken in secret. From the time it took place... I was there, and now the Lord God has sent me and his spirit. Hmm. Let's read verse 17 before I talk. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, I am the Lord your God, who teaches you to profit, who leads you in the way you should go. Well, from verse 17, we know who's talking. The Lord, the Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the I am, the Lord your God, we all know. Those are phrases that we know and we understand. And he's the one speaking and saying in verse 16 then, come in near to me, listen to this. Um, well, I, I'll read the whole thing again. From the first I've not spoken in secret. From the time it took place, I was there. From the very beginning, I was there. And now the Lord God has sent me and his spirit so, obviously, God has been sent, and his spirit has come also into this world in a way that was not suddenly created, suddenly began. It existed before. It's no secret. But now it's, he's been sent to earth. This obviously is foreshadowing, telling us of his coming into our world. We know it through virgin birth, Isaiah 7, 14, that obviously God is personifying himself in the Son in this earthly realm. And that's what we're seeing. Look at Psalm 45, verses 6 and 7. Tehillim, Psalm 45, verses 6 and 7. Psalm 45, 6 and 7 says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. And any Jewish person who knows some of their scriptures knows God, is, he's the high on his throne. Elohei Yisrael, uh, Elohei Hayim, the most high God. That's who's being talked about here. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever a scepter of uprightness in the scepter of your kingdom. You've loved righteousness and hated wickedness, therefore God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of joy above your fellows. Well, if God's on his throne up here, who's he anointing over here who's above the fellows, who's above the other humans? Would that not be God in human flesh, God the Son, who is higher than all the rest? He's the first begotten, the first ranked of, of, um, with God. If you think I'm reading into this, then go with me to Hebrews 1 and see why Hebrews 1 tells us what I'm just saying. Hebrews written to the Hebrew people, I don't think that could be more clear whether you argue over the author or not. It's to the Hebrew people. 
chapter 1, verse 8 says, But the Son says, okay, I just read in Isaiah, God says. Now I'm reading in Hebrews, the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever, and the righteous scepter is the scepter of his kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your companions. Hello. Wait a minute. Isaiah talked about that, or I'm sorry, Psalm, the, the psalmist talked about that being God, and now Hebrews is talking about that being God's son. How can that be unless the two are one? So again, we see God the Father, God the Son. We can interchange what we're saying about them. We see that very well in, in Revelation chapter 1, by the way. Go through that on your own. Read that description. Take every line and look for it in Scripture. And you'll start out and say, oh, okay, this is a description of the Father. And then you're going to say, oh, wait a minute. This is a description of the Son. Oh, now wait a minute. Now it's a description of the Father. Wait a minute. Now we're talking about the Son, and you're going to be so crossed all the way through that at the end of that, that beautiful description, and someone asks you, was it the Father or the Son? I'll tell you the answer. Yes, you said it, exactly, yes. <laughs> the answer is yes. Hebrews 1, verses 8 and 9 quotes Psalm 45, 6 to 7. Psalm gives the credit to God the Father. Hebrews is giving credit with the Son. Another very familiar is Psalm 110, 1. Psalm 110, 1. Talim, chapter 110, verse 1. And this one, very, very well known. Whoops, what happened? I didn't get to, I got stuck in Hebrews. There we go. Okay. The Lord says to my Lord. Okay, we have Adonai and uh, Jehovah, if I remember right, are the two that are talking. Uh, yeah, could be. Don't quote me on that. I'll get my brain about me in just a moment. Okay, I'll tell you what. I don't want to leave that there. Let me do it in my other reference, and I will have that answer. Um, I know this is well as the pack of my hand. That's why I'm choking on it. <laughs> okay. Psalm 110, one, yeah. Jehovah said to Adonai. Okay. The Lord, Jehovah, says to my Lord, Adonai. Now, Jehovah, and we'll get into this more in chapter 2, Yahweh is the more Hebrew way, Yehovah is the more Latin way, but it's one and the same. When that word is used, it's usually referring to God in the Father position, and Adonai is almost always referring to the Son, to the Lord Master in that position. But you've got the Lord saying to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Okay, so... The Father, Yehovah, Yahweh, is saying to Adonai, to the Lord, Master, the one that we know as Yeshua, Jesus, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Now go with me real quick to Acts. And this, I love to show my Jewish people, this shows you that when we take a sneak peek, when you're willing to look at that new covenant side, you're going to find out it's a continuation. You're going to find out it's very Jewish. You're going to find out that we're still in Jewish scriptures with Jewish terminology, completing the Jewish thoughts that are in the original. So it's not that we've got into something else foreign. It is right here just a continuing of our own scriptures and our own story. Acts 2, verses 34 to 36, I read to you there. For it was not David who ascended into the heaven, but he himself said. See, the psalmist, where we started with it in Psalm 110, written by David. David wasn't speaking about himself, even though he carried the title Lord. He wasn't speaking about himself. We're told that clearly here. And by the way, you can be asking yourself, Jewish mind, well, if this is a Christian book and not a Jewish book, then why are we talking about David at all? And why are we talking about what David said? Go figure that one out. While you're working on that one, let me read to you what David said. For it was not David who ascended into heaven, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Okay, at, you have just lifted a verse right out of my Jewish scriptures, and you've landed it in your book. You 
quoted it word for word. I know that in the Psalms, David wrote it, but when did God say that to David? He didn't. Who did he say it to then? Who's he talking about? And as we continue on in this new covenant that is continuing from our original, we're going to come to that book again that I just looked at a minute ago. That book that's written to the Hebrew people. If it's written to my Hebrew people, I think I can trust it and not be afraid of it. I think it's got to be, if it's for the Hebrews, then it's for the Hebrews. So let's go to Hebrews, because I'm going to see that Hebrews has something to say about this also. Go to Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 13. Hebrews 1 and verse 13. Now, remember, it's Psalm 110 where we started. Then we saw it quoted in Acts. We know it can't be David that's being spoken about, even though David wrote this and had that title too. But now in Hebrews 1.13, we have it said, but to which of the angels has he ever said, and we'll identify he in a moment, but to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Okay, you got my attention, God. You said it three times now. You said it by my, 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 the first, well, second king of Israel, my favorite king, King David, Melch David. You've said it in that book called Acts that's telling us actions of what took place as the story went on. And now when you're writing to my people, my Hebrew people specifically, you're saying the same thing you said back here. So I've got a Jewish line here. That doesn't end. And in my Jewish line, I've got to know now, how do I have two gods? Well, if the Lord, Yehovah, Yahweh, God the Father, said to Adonai, the Lord, Master, the Son, when he took on human form, if this is the one he's speaking to, is there a time that we know that God said to Yeshua, sit here at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. And we've got a complete picture because we know this one we call Yeshua. When he ascended after his human life, after death, burial, and resurrection, went up into the heavens and was told by God, sit here until I make the enemies your footstool. And we know when he comes back in his second coming, he will come back, finishing off the enemies that have been made his footstool and building his millennial kingdom on earth where the enemies are under his feet. The fulfillment of what God promised Melch David, there would be one who would sit on his seat, his throne, who would receive these promises. Now we've got God the Father telling God the Son and we understand it, and we see it as one because this one was made a little lower than the angels when he took on that human form that we read about, and he didn't stay there. That was for a time while he was on this earth. Then he was lifted up, and we know he is at the right hand of the Father. Go to Revelation 5, and you will see in Revelation 5, God sitting on the throne. Then you'll see a second throne, or a throne built for two, a love seat built for two. I love it. There's no fighting. There's equality here. And you see the lamb before the throne as if he'd been slain, receiving from the hand of the Father the title deed to the earth where he will make his kingdom. Thy will be done on heaven, in heaven, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is the completion of this picture, and we've got a beautiful picture showing us that we have one God, but he shows us himself as the Father, and he shows himself as the Son, and we bring these together and realize this is the great let us make man in our image. Now, when I told you a little bit ago, man is triunity, body, soul, and spirit, it fits because that's God who is triunity and we are made in God's image. So the way that God can be in that three, 
we are made in that image also. When we see and we know all of this, and when we go back to verse 26, where we're going back right now, Genesis 1, and we read those pregnant words, let us, we now know God is going to make, and we, we, we know the whole story here, so we know God's making man. He's making man in our image, he says. Again, a plural word. He is not speaking to the angels, because how is man made in the form of an angel? He's not. The angels are totally different. The ones that are described do not look like humans. They can take on human form, don't get me wrong, but we see them described with wings, and we see them with ability to fly, and we see them in a total different makeup than we are. And when God says, let us make man in our image, if he were pulling the angels in, then the angels would have to be equal to God. And they're not. We know that. Nothing is equal to God. So if God's using the plurality, he has to be speaking about himself. That makes him Father, Son, and Spirit. And we know that that is who the let us is that there is this verbal exchange between the Godhead, that God the Father can look at God the Son and speak to God the Son. We'll see that through all of eternity. That amazes me. So when we have let us make man in our image, it is not the royal we that God is so royal that he used a plural majesticness and it's not a we that's speaking about God in anything less than God. So it's not angels or animals or anything else. God in his Godhead is speaking to himself and yet speaking to another in a way that blows our minds. But remember, a man can be a husband, a father, and a son all at the same time. And yet he's one person. He plays three different roles. Well, that's the earthly way of trying to understand the heavenly. God the Father speaking to God the Son, the Spirit carrying out what is being spoken about. We have the triunity of our God. We have the Godhead coming together, and we have them saying they are making man in their image. We are made in the image of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's why we also have a spirit within us, why it separates us from the animals from the swarmers that are swarming, from the birds that are flying, from the angelic that we don't even t aren't even told about in our creation, but we know that it's different than that. This is what we're seeing. Let me ask you, is there any indication in Scripture elsewhere of that kind of fellowship between the Father and the Son? And I'll tell you, oh yes, again and again and again and again, but I'll just give you a couple real quickly. Let's look at Matthew eleven twenty-seven. 27. Matthew's written by a Jewish boy. He's written to a Jewish audience. So I'm going to pick on him to show us what was said about this Jewish one on this earth. Okay, Matthew 11 and verse 27. It's Yeshua speaking. Now he's been born. He is in his early 30s. He is doing his ministry. And he is saying in verse 30, not 30, sorry, verse, what did I tell you, 27, verse 27. All things have been handed over to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal him. So, Yeshua Jesus is saying, God's handed this over to me. I know God, God knows me, and nobody else has privy to that relationship, except those who I choose to give it to. And who does he give it to? Those who will come to believe in him. He gives it to them. But it shows the Father and the Son have an interaction. They have a talk going on. How many times did we read that the, that the Lord went alone to be with his Father? That he went off to the mountains and into prayer to communicate with his Father because he needed that, that fellowship again. Look at Yochanan, John 8. 42. John 8 and verse 42. John 8 and verse 42. Yeshua Jesus said to them, If God were your Father, so we're talking about Yehovah, we're talking about uh, um, God the Father, I'll say in heaven. 
if God were your father, you would love me. You, you would love Jesus, Yeshua. For I proceeded forth and have come from God. For I have not even come on my own initiative, but he sent me. There's relationship there again. God said to the son, go. And he said, I'll go. And he went. Okay? Look at chapter 17, verses 3 and 24. Chapter 17, verses 3 and 24. Chapter 17, verse 3. This is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God. And in, in English, Jesus Christ. In Hebrew, Yeshua HaMashiach. Whom you have sent. Okay? How do we get eternal life? By knowing the one true God. How do we know the one true God? Through Yeshua Jesus, whom God has sent. The Father and the Son had a relationship before the Son here on this earth. Verse 24, Father, Yeshua Jesus speaking, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, be with me where I am, so that they may see my glory, which you have given me. For you loved me before the foundation of the world. Okay, Yeshua is speaking to the Father, requesting for something to be given to his followers. That Yeshua said, I've been with you before the foundation of the world. That makes him God. Because only God existed before the foundation of the world. Humans did not. We just read about the creation of the world and human creation we're reading about right now. So this shows a relationship, a fellowship between the one we call Mashiach, Messiah, and the one that we call Yehovah, God the Father. So these two, in their relationship, said to each other, let's make man in our image. And it's one and the same. Okay? Very, very important that we do not see anything else able to fit that category. Not angelic, not creature, nothing. It is it reserved for God, God alone, manifested in his triune spirit that we will okay. see. So what was the, okay, you have given me, be with me when I am, so that they... So what did he give us? I mean, are you going to tell us now or wait until we <laughs> um, Okay, the short would be go back and look at verse 22. The glory which you've given me, I've given to them. that They may be one just as we are one. So what we've been given is the glory of the Lord, which in essence when we are saved and we are sealed by the Holy Spirit, we come into his glory and we exude his glory. When we're showing forth our light, it's his glory that's being seen. Okay. Okay. That's what he's given to us, that we can be in his Shekhinah glory. And if you begin to go into a study of what that glory is, oh, wow, that'll take you flying through the atmosphere and then some. I did a, a, a lesson on the Shekhinah glory of God just before Christmas, and I haven't touched ground since. <laughs> I, that's all. I'll put it up on uh, the Bitly site. In fact, it may already be there, and you can go listen to it because it's a whole lesson in itself, but it is amazing. And thank you because you were the instigator. You don't even know it, but you asked a question, and in my research to answer your question better, the Lord took me into this whole study of Wow. I guess I'm going to go watch it. So, yeah, it's pretty exciting. I think you'll thoroughly enjoy it. Um, that's what's being referred to. And, and we do, and we talk about it. We know there are times where we're basking in His glory. You can just feel it and sense it and see it. And there are times when you catch a vision of the Lord in that glory. And when you know our promise is eternity, eternity the eternal home in the glory. Whew. Wow. Wow. You, you, you guys just tripped on a land, I don't call it a landmine, but a huge, huge, what, what all is in that glory, it, it'd take me a year to try to, and I still wouldn't get it all across to you. But does that satisfy for now? Okay, good question. Good question. I'd love to see that you're thinking. Question? Yes, Anna? The, the last reference that we just referred to with the glory? Having to do with 22 verse 20. Have what, what John 17, Okay, I, I think you've got to be, yeah, we just read John 17. I initially read verses 3 and 24.
Because the door is questioned, I backed up and started at verse 22 in John 17. And it tells us that it's the glory. The glory. Yeah. Yeah, and thank you too. Okay, so back to Genesis. I love our side trips, though. They're very important. And I see I took away Genesis. I, I did an oops, so give me just a second. Yeah, there we go. I'm back to Genesis, okay. <laughs> Um, we're still in verse 26. We're in that wonderful, let us make man in our image. I think I've convinced you all who the us is. And then making, make the word in our Hebrew is a saw. It's not bara. Everybody thinks, okay, wait a minute, aren't we bara? Because we were, we were created out of nothing. Now actually, um, and, and hang on and you'll get the balance of this. But we were made out of something that already existed. Because remember, God took the dust of the ground and he formed Adam out of the dust of the ground. Now, he didn't become man until God breathed into him. There's where your creation, your bara, is going to come. Is out of the creation when he became a living being. But uh, man was formed out of the same ground as the animals, we're told. And again... Um, man returns to dust, dust to dust, ashes to ashes, same as we said about the animals. But man's structure, his physical, his mental, are far more complex than any of the animals. The animals, we see a lot of, um, of uh, amazing, like I just read about the, how this little bird was made. But when it comes to the complexity of the mind, the reasoning that the mind is able to do, um, the ability to think um, in that capacity in relation to God, that's different. You know, so that, that's a higher level. If man is more sophisticated, I'll put it that way, although that's far too weak of a word, but then the animals that were created. It's just that we have the same basic ingredients, you know, the, the earthly minerals and all that, that we're made up out of. Okay? So what again, once again, in our image, one God, but more personages than one. And again, can't be speaking to anything else. He's not speaking to angels or anything else because then they'd have to be God. Because he didn't say he's taking something else to join with him. It's, it's he himself being the our, the plural. Okay? And that our likeness then we see how God made man in his likeness. Man has that eternal spirit. We know that that spirit goes on, lives when this shell, when we peel out of the shell. There's a funny little poem. I'll get it for next week. It's cute. Yeah, I can't do it. I'll have to look it up. But when we peel out of this shell, that spirit goes on living because that's God breathed. And what God has breathed in does not end. Okay, that's, uh, that's the, the above everything else that he has created at this point. Um, but what I'm trying to say as far as when it says it's in his likeness, what are we saying now? We're talking about um, the aesthetics we're talking about man, because he's made in God's image, is capable of sensation, of appreciation. Uh, he can see beauty and appreciate beauty. He can taste. Um, he has moral attributes. He has spiritual attributes. He has a free will. He has a moral consciousness, the ability to think abstractly and how it's in relation to others. Um, in that beauty that I talked about, the, to understand or appreciate beauty, in that comes the capacity to worship and love God. That's all in that. And yet at the same time still have that free will that God made us in such a way that we are not robotic puppets of his. That's amazing. That's our God. But God formed man's body, and I love this, he formed man's body so that he can function physically in ways that God functions without a body. Now, I'll tell you why I love this in a minute, because you've got to get to the final thought. But this is where, it let, let your mind just go up above what's our human era, okay? Because we are conscious of humanity. To speak 
we have to have a mouth. To hear, we have to have ears. If we have something made that doesn't have ears, it doesn't hear. If it doesn't have a mouth, it doesn't speak. Okay? God's doing that without a mouth, without ears. What does God look like? He shows himself in those manifestations. Like when we read Daniel 9, the, the description, we see the eyes that, that are fiery eyes. We see wool of hair. But we know God's not, he, he didn't, he wasn't birthed to have eyes and hair. And he just, he makes himself seen in that way. But he has the ability to communicate without a mouth, to be able to see without eyes like ours. You know, he, he's not limited. This is where you can think that I don't get that, Rochelle. Okay, I don't either. <laughs> but I believe it. On the basis of my faith, I know it to be true. And I'm going to tip my hand right now before I go back and give you these examples. Why does this so thrill me? Is because this shows me. I know from Scripture, God planned salvation before the foundations of the world. We know that. We know the Scripture tells us clearly that the Lord loved us before the foundations of the world and put into motion our salvation. God knew before he created that he was going to have to take on the form of his creation to save them. Because it had to be a human to redeem the human race. It couldn't be anything else. That's why the blood of bulls and goats could not redeem. They could cover, but they couldn't redeem. It takes human blood to redeem human blood. God, knowing he was going to have to take on that form, made that form, when he's creating in his likeness, made that form 100% able for God to manifest himself in that form, for God to be able to become a human being. That's phenomenal. That's putting the cart before the horse because he knew that the horse was going to have to carry the cart. <laughs> that just blows my mind. That's why God made the human in such a distinct way and so differently from the other animals and all because he made that human to be um, compatible with his essence. How else can I put it? This is hard. The, 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 our English words are hard. They're tricky here. But he made us in a way that he could step into that human form and relate to us and save us in that human form. And this was all planned before verse 26. Before verse 1. Because it, we're told before the foundations of the world, God had planned this. That amazes me. He knew he would appear in a human body, and he made that human body in such a way that the, when the day came that he took it on, it would work. That's amazing. That's amazing. You know, I say it often that God slipped into time and space. He put on a face. That's what I'm talking about. It's like NASA wanted to go to space, and so they had to create a space suit and put man inside that spacesuit for man to be able to go into space. And it's still that way. Man can't just go into space in his human body and survive it. But NASA had to think about that and has to look at what it has to be like and then has to try to create something and then, the, and then they have to clothe it because they can't make a human that way. So they have to encapsulate the human. You see the difference? God didn't have to make something else, and he made the human so that he could be, he, his, his essence could encapsulate itself in that human to save that human. That's just amazing. I hope I'm communicating, because I really feel the lack of vocabulary to get this thought across. But the, the distinct moral, intellectual, spiritual capabilities God could become man because man was completely cap uh, compatible because man was made in God's image. I think I just said it. That sentence I like, <laughs> okay? What did you say? Exactly. Can I say it again? <laughs> God 
made man morally, intellectually, and spiritually with those capabilities. He made man so he made man completely compatible with his image so that he could incorporate man to save man. Okay, but then I'm confused because that means that he made us in his likeness, like you yes. said. But yes. But then you say that he doesn't have any ears and right. eyes, and so, so how right. can that be? Either he, we like him or we're... We are like him. We are able to hear. He can hear. We need an ear to do it. And he made us with an ear because we're not God. He made us. He made us with an ear to hear. And he could climb into our body and use our ears to hear. So he made it work. But he's not stuck having to have ears on the side of his head to hear. But he, he made it in that way that, so that we can relate. So that we can relate. Like when we see him in those descriptions in Revelation 1, we see him with a body. And yet we know God's not got a body. Uh -huh. We know he's not. The son took on the body. But God the Father doesn't have that body. When we see him in Daniel 9, we see him have a hair's wool, eyes fiery um, like fire. It's talking about judgment. I'm trying to think what other. But, but when we see all that, that's a description based on humanness. When we get to heaven and we have an ability to know and understand beyond our humanness, we'll see God, we'll hear God, but it won't be a God that looks human. It'll be in the form that God is in that we'll see Jesus in that human form because I believe Jesus keeps that for all of eternity. We'll see the nail prints in his hands, mm -hmm. we'll see his feet, but God is not going to be identical to Jesus in appearance. And yet, how do you say it? We just don't have the human ability to fully comprehend. But he used the human resources that he gave us to help us be able to understand him. But really, if you want to face on God, you have to go to Jesus. And yet, it'll talk about God having a face so that we can relate, so that we can say, okay, God hears, God sees, God feels, God touches, God you know, knows and understands. And yet, and yet, he's not confined to that. He can hear with them ears. He can see with them eyes. He, he has a, a personification that's not stuck in this form. Does that help at all? Well, I mean, would it be like he made us in, in their likeness something that he would be comfortable being when he come to earth? Yeah. I mean, is it you is can that say a good that. Mm -hmm. analogy? Yeah. yeah, you can say that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and maybe the same way that we see other animals here and see, but yet we're not in their, you know, we don't have an, a dog ear. We don't have a sparrow's eye, you know, but, but in the same way, God doesn't have the human, he has greater than, and he's, his may be in a whole different way of appearance, we don't know, because we haven't ever seen him, but he knew he could put himself in to that human form, he made that human form so he could, so he could, he didn't make the dogs that way, because he wasn't going to ever enter that dog's body. He didn't make the whale that way because he wasn't ever going to enter into the whale to save the whale. So that's where I'm saying the difference. And it just shows a four plan mm -hmm. that if I try to create something now and I want it for a certain reason and, and I make something, you know, I'm, I'm a, I've got a prototype and I make it and I put that prototype out there you don't want that first generation because this can have all kinds of issues and problems. Oh, this doesn't work quite right and I need to tweak that and I do this and I do that. And we get down two, three, four generations, we kind of like our product. Well, he could look ahead before that product ever existed, make that product perfectly to work with what he intended for that product to do. That's a phenomenal. And it just shows us why we're separated 
He never intended to save the angels. He didn't make himself an angelic form. He never intended to save the animals. And I'm not against any PETA members here. <laughs> you know, he intended to have a special relationship with the human race. And he made that human in a way that that human could, uh, and I don't want to say absorb God, but when he put Yeshua in the womb of a girl, wow, that's miraculous, and that's what I'm saying. And he made that human in such a way he knew he could slip into that human one day. So he had to make us different than everything else. And here we have it. You're going to be made in my image so that I can rescue you. That's love. That's amazing. Um, this says the human body is uniquely appropriate to God's manifestation of himself. If that helps, you know, he designed man's body with that purpose in mind. That's amazing. That's amazing. Um, I see my time. I want to do this one thought because it'd be too hard to pick it back up and start later. So give me five minutes over our usual, like I usually run over. And let me say um, very quickly, and we'll try to look these verses up quickly. If you can't keep up with me, it's in your cross-references, so no worries. Mm -hmm. But the way that God is so that we can function in a way that, that has this relation that we're talking about, we said, okay, God can see. That was one of the first examples we gave. Genesis 16 and verse 13. Genesis 16, 13. Then she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. You are a God who sees. Okay, This is Hagar talking about God. You are a God who sees. For she said, I, have I ever remained alive here after seeing him? Okay, God sees. Scripture tells us he sees. 2 Chronicles 16, 9. 2 Chronicles 16 and verse 9. 2 Chronicles 16, 9, and we read there, For the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth, that he may strongly support those whose heart is completely his. Okay, the eyes of the Lord looking to and fro over the earth. And that's a good example because my eyes are moving right now, and all I can see is wall to wall. His eyes being greater than ours, not limited in our way. He can see the entire universe. He can see the entire world. He can see what I'm doing and what someone else is doing. And he can see more than our actions outwardly. He's seeing right through to the heart. I can't see your heart, Dora. I can't see Julie's heart. I can't see Roger's heart. <laughs> I can think I know what their heart is. And that, that could be camouflaged and I could be fooled. But God sees. So we know God sees. Scripture tells us God hears. Psalm 94. Psalm 94. God hears. And believe me, there are many, many more verses. I'm just giving an example. Psalm 94, verse 9. He who planted the ear, does he not hear? He who formed the eye, does he not see? Exodus. Shmote. Exodus chapter 2, verse 24. Shmote. Exodus 2, 24 says to us, So God heard their groaning. God remembered his covenant with Abraham. So God hears. God can smell. Okay? God smells. Genesis 8. We'll get this again after a while, but we probably won't remember it by the time we get there. Genesis 8, verses 20 and 21. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord, took of every clean animal and every clean bird, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. The Lord smelled, verse 21, the Lord smelled the soothing aroma. The Lord said to himself, I will never curse again the ground, and it goes on. So God smells. And we know that we talk about our prayers going up as a sweet-smelling savor unto the Lord, that he's, I smell my saints praying. And it's a good smell to him. God smells. God knows. Psalm 94, 11. If I remembered, I would have told you to hold your finger there. Psalm 94 and verse 11. God knows. The Lord knows the thoughts of man, that they are mere breath. All our thoughts, mere breath, that's it. God knows. God can touch. Okay, God touches. God feels in that way. Genesis, whoops, Genesis 32, 
and verse 25. Genesis 32 and verse 25. When he saw that he had not prevailed against him, the side of God, he touched the socket of, and it's Jacob's thigh. Um, so that it was dislocated. This is when Jacob was wrestling with the Lord all night, okay? God touched him. Verse 30. So Jacob named the place Peniel, for he said, I have seen God face to face, yet my life has been preserved. So we know it was God. And verse 32, Therefore to this day the sons of Israel do not eat the sinew of the hip, which is on the socket of the thigh, because he, God, touched the socket of Jacob's thigh in the sinew of the hip. Okay, so God touches. God remembers. I have a horrible forgetter. I'm glad God remembers. <laughs> Exodus 2 and verse 24. It tells us there, Shmote, chapter 2, I think I read verse 24 a minute ago. Yet yeah, God heard the groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Avraham. And God speaks. Okay, we, we talked about this. God has a voice. God speaks. Second Peter, Second Kepha, chapter one, and we're going to look at verses seventeen and eighteen. Second Peter one, seventeen and eighteen. For when we when he received honor and glory from God the Father, such an utterance as this was made to him by the majestic glory. That means God spoke in his glory. This is my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. And we ourselves heard this utterance from the heaven, and we were with him on the holy mountain. Peter was one of the ones that was privy to that, hearing that voice, the voice of God speaking. We know that God spoke when he shook him up out of the waters of baptism and said, This is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. We know that God spoke to uh, Shaul Paul when he knocked him off his high horse, and the voice came out of heaven. The others heard a voice, but or saw the light, but didn't hear the voice. Paul heard the voice. God speaks. So God, knowing he would become a man, God prepared a body for his son to envelop in time. That's what I've been trying to say, okay? That's Hebrews 10 and verse 5. Hebrews 10 and verse 5. And remember, the key word for the book of Hebrews is? Better. Better. So we've got something better here. Hebrews 10. And verse 5. Therefore, when he comes into the world, he says, Sacrifice and offering you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. God prepared that body for Messiah to enter into that body. Amazing. Luke 1.35. Luke 1.35. We've been thinking a lot about that through our Christmas season. God becoming flesh. God coming into this world. It, it, it amazes me. Verse 35. The angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. So that tells us how it happened. It happened because the Holy Spirit and the power from the Most High came upon Miriam and she became pregnant, the virgin birth. We were made in the likeness of God because he was going to come in the likeness of man. Philippians 2, 5 through 7 tells us that, that, that he came fashioned as a man, made himself a little lower, that um, I'm saying it all poorly. I'm trying I'm trying to hurry food. Forget the hurry. Forget the clock. I'm reading it to you. Okay? Because I'm botching it otherwise. The Word of God is too important. Philippians 2, 5 through 7. Okay. My tablet froze. Maybe I'm supposed to stop. There we go. Okay. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Mashiach Yeshua, Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equal with God to be a thing to be grasped. He chose to let go of that. He emptied himself, took on the form of a bondservant, being made in the likeness of man. This is what we're talking about. Being found in the appearance of man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even the death on the cross. For this reason also, God highly exalted him, Bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so the name of Yeshua, Jesus, every knee will bow. Those in heaven, earth, and under the earth. Every tongue is going to confess. Okay? So, 
that's what's been going on here. Knowing from the, the foundation of the world from before that, that he would need this body to accomplish his will. He took on that. He, he created man in that form that man could be the house. How is that? That man could be the house for God um, in human form. Okay? Come on, I'm having trouble with my tablet because I'm trying to hurry and it just doesn't want to take. I'm going to Acts 15, verse 18, real quickly. Um, says the Lord who made these things known from long ago. Oh, okay, I guess that's all I'm just saying with that. That God planned it right from the beginning. God made man in that image to one day assume it. And Mashiach came in human form. We know that. Yet he also was at the same time the express glory of God. That's Hebrews 1.3. We've gone through that before. That in the image of God, he was fully God. And he became fully man. Um, okay, I think I've said it well to us. Now, what happened then? Because we know there's a breakdown now. And that breakdown is because of sin. When man brought sin into his realm, he lost that likeness that he had with God. Adam and Eve were different as human beings before they sinned than after they sinned. Now they had to eat to live. Before, it wasn't. It was eating for pleasure, but it wasn't that they had to eat to live. Now, their bodies are decaying and dying. Now, they know fear, and now they, you know, all, everything that, that sin brought in. Man's likeness changed. I do believe that there's a change in appearance. I believe that there was a glory that was lost in the same sense of the Shekhinah glory of God. When God is that glory and created us in his image, I believe he created us originally in that glory, and when sin entered in, that glory was lost. And we have what we have that is all we know. But I, I think for Adam and Eve, they were able to look at each other. They knew they needed to cover themselves now. So they, there was a nakedness shame now that wasn't there. I believe that there was a like a glory around them that changed and that they knew, you know, there's a consequence to what we've done. It showed. So that that's what's happened. We've lost the likeness to the degree we had it. Sin's what has ruined it, but God knew that, knew that would happen, and knew that he could breathe into man, make man this living being, enter into that man, and redeem that man through his perfect life one day. So the breath of God became the soul of man. The soul of man was made in his image, in its glory, and then sin robbed us of it. And there's the change that we live with to this day. So when you get hurt, when you do things wrong, when your body's wearing out on you, you can thank Adam and Eve. <laughs> but before you want to get too upset with them, put yourself there. If you would have done any better, God would have put you there. God didn't say, oh, I'll, I'll create Adam and Rochelle. Because <laughs> Rochelle will home. <laughs> I would have done the same thing. So poor Eve. Then she gets the, the brunt of our anger. And so does Adam. But... Um, I, I'm going to stop us here. We will pick up at this thought of being in the image of our God. But I just want you to see the richness of, of the human, the gift that we've been given that, that puts us up on that level above everything else God created. I'm fascinated at God's creation and bringing you out the extraordinary detail, de details of all that God created, wanting you to realize how majestic, how mighty, how great, how ineffable, how indescribable our God is. And at the same time, his crowning glory of what he created is man. It, it really is. And not messed up man, but man. <laughs> okay. Yes, yeah. And, and just work on that for a week and be ready to come back and see what that means and, and why it's so important that we were made in his image with that free will 
you know, I'm always being asked, well, why did God do it that way? <laughs> so we'll come up with what answers we can, but uh, again, we're going to also see that in God's mind, he was created originally also. Okay, we'll see that when we get into the wording from the Hebrew next week. I went a little longer than I thought finishing that thought, but it, it was too much to try to bring it back, so thank you for forgiving me. I'm not going to say anything about starting the new year off the same way I ended the whole year. <laughs> but I'm a work in progress, I'll just say that. I'm, I'm working my way back to being in that glory completely. Even, even the scripture tells us we are to be moving from glory to glory. We're to be becoming more like that glory. That's the glory that we've lost that some of us need a little more of than others. But uh, let me just stop babbling and questions, comments. Uh, I thank you for being back, wanting to learn. I hope it's not been a, a hard to understand class. I hope it's been a blessing. It's my blessing to share it and give it. And, and trust me, there's some real aha moments coming. Uh, I think we've had some today, too, not that, that this hasn't been, but hang in there with me. I ask the Lord all the time, help me not just babble. <laughs> Maria? Uh, the last, uh, um, you, you gave, uh, all I got is 15, 18, what book was that? Acts. Acts. Book besides books, I guess, I don't know. Uh, that's uh, accomplishing... Yeah, Acts 15, 18 says the Lord who makes these things known from long ago. See, it's his will. He, the Lord said it. It's his oh, will. It's the Lord who makes these things known yes. long ago? Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Rowena? Yeah, my aha moment is when you were saying like God created us in his image. So his love is so much for us. He knew that he had to come to us, and if we were not created in his image, he could never come to us and save us. Exactly. In the form of man. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you, you for that. Well, Emphasis. thank you. <laughs> and and, and but, also the, the, the ability, because God is, uh, is an, so uh, amazing, so, so great, that he had to make, he had to make that, made us smaller in order for me for us to be exactly like God look what have to be done right right and he had a way of limiting himself that's what it tells us in Philippians 2 that, that the Lord limited himself to become us you know he, he let aside some of his God abilities um, you know in some way so that he could fit in. You know, I picture a cup and we put something in that cup that, that fills it exactly, you know, that, that that's like a liquid, so it fills it exactly. And it's like that, that God made that container, but then when he put that liquid in there, that that's himself, that's where I say, and, and this is our God, I'm always saying it, how can you take the ocean and put it in the teacup? Well, guess what? God did. He took himself and he put him in a human. That he did it. Well, you know, and, he did it. yeah, and it, and it says, you know, that 26, it says, then God said, let us make man in our image. It doesn't say exactly like No, that. no, no, our in image our image. According, yes. It's according to his likeness. Yes. Not exactly. Yeah, no, it. we're not a duplicate. Yeah. You know, that that's what, when that question was, well, you know, we were made uh, like God, but it's according mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. his likeness. Right, right. Not exactly like him. Right, because like we said, he doesn't see with eyes like we see with, but he made us with eyes to see, so that we could see because he sees. We can hear because he hears. We can touch because he touches. But yes, it's not an exact duplicate. The only right, duplication, and it's not a duplicate, is the son. Is his yeah, express but, image. See, we are limited. God, in every, in every, uh, thing every, that every, has, every, he every. is unlimited. Yes. Like you said, he can see the beginning and the end. Yes. We are only uh, able to see what we see, what is in front of us at that moment. Yep. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. And that's the perfect example to see how he limited and brought in. But it, it just, it shows me again how great our God is that he could 
think of this and carry it out and make it so that it works. You know, he didn't make it a human and say, oops, I need model number two, <laughs> you know, formula 409. Y'all know what, why it's called formula 409? If you don't, it's literally the 409th attempt to make that cleaning formula <laughs> that's called formula 409. 408 times they made changes and then they said, aha, we got it. Well, God didn't make man one, man two, man three. <laughs> he got it. He made it amazing, indescribable, ineffable. Y'all, I'm welcome to some new words. Help me build my vocabulary. <laughs> Lita, I think you wanted to say something. Uh oh, you're you're muted, Lita. You're muted. Lita, we're not hearing you. And I don't think she's hearing me because she's not stopping. <laughs> Lita, unmute yourself. She's still muted, Roger. Yeah, I asked her to unmute. That's all I can do. <laughs> there, she there we go. Now yeah. say again, you are pouring your heart out. Yeah, it's so inspiring to remind us that God created us in His image, according to His likeness, making us the apple of His eyes. Yes. And has given us actually dominion over all His other creations. So, yes. you see how, how great yes. is our God and how loving yes. and faithful He is to us. Amen. 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 And don't say before I let you jump in, I've just got to say, Lena just gave me a, a, another perfect example. She was pouring her heart out with what she was saying, and I couldn't hear a word. God made it work. He broke through that. He brought it in a way that worked. Thank you, Roger. You made it work. <laughs> Dosa, your turn. Uh, I was going to say, can you hear me? Yes. I always thought that God was not like us. Oh. Uh, we was not like I'm sure he didn't have a face. I always felt that it was like a maybe a spirit that a ray of sunlight that uh, would be everywhere. So I never pictured him being human like us, uh, being a person with a skin or a face. I never did, but I didn't say anything because I was afraid to say because I didn't know if I was right or wrong. You're not afraid to say, and I won't say that God is human like us, but we in our humanity were made like him. You know, there's a flip side to that. Um, but, but, yeah, I think you're getting a new thought, and uh, let it run for a while. See where it goes in your mind and how, it, it, how the Spirit brings, you know, that conviction, aha, this is the truth, I've got it now. Because we're all trying to grasp it, Dosi. None of us fully understand this. I'm blown away by this. You know, it, 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 I know I can't really quite grasp hold of it. So it, this is a hard one to teach. I tell you honestly, this is a hard one to teach. I, I'm praying the whole time, Spirit of God, teach this. You know, teach this, reveal this, because uh, it's. How do you touch? And how do you explain him? Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. How do you get that? Exactly. Exactly. Thank you, Michelle, thank you for teaching it word by word. Oh. Like, thank I'm you, so Lord. Happy that you went back to teach it word by word mm. because we just we need it that way. How can you, uh, I, I don't want to miss a word. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, yes, Sam. Right. <laughs> um, one thing that today brought to me, which I uh, I hadn't thought of before, is that when he said, um, he looked and he saw that it was good, that much farther reach does the immediate creation. It, it According to what, you, what mm -hmm. we've been learning today, mm -hmm. is that that it would it accomplish would. right 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 and in the, and in the same the same note 
uh, he was not uh, going piece by piece. He was able to see the whole thing. Right. Now, you see what right. I'm saying? In order for us to, to, when we create something, we have to go piece by piece to make sure that it's good. Right. He just looked at it. He looked at it and... And it was complete. Just, yeah. And it was good. Yes, and it was good. And God blessed it. And God blessed it. You know, we want God's blessing. We need God's blessing. Yes. Yeah. All the time. I agree, Beatrice, all the time. Pour it on, Lord. All the time. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, I feel like I have just began to introduce us to creation. I, you know, I mean, it took us, what, six, seven classes? And I, I feel like all we've done is scrape the surface that we're in preschool or we're in kindergarten and we think we've got something, we've learned something, and the Lord's up there chuckling and saying, well, just wait till you get to college. <laughs> but, uh, but he knows us, and, and I know he can only reveal to us what, what we can contain. Uh, but, oh. You know, if, if you were to carry that thought a little farther about that he saw that it was good, and then on the seventh day he rested. Oh, we will. We um, will. We will. You're right, running ahead, but go for it. <laughs> I don't want to take... Go ahead. Go to... ahead. Go ahead. I love it. Well, I, I may not be going where you think I'm going. Um, it, it, and he rested. It sounds... It could be. I mean, this might be my own... Of course, it is my own thought at the moment. I haven't biblically um, established this, so forgive me, it's just projection. But when it's finished, when our Lord said it's finished, when we have the heavens where the Lord wants it positioned, and we're all family together, praising and loving Him in His place, then all of creation can rest. It will finally, yes, finally yes. be done. Yes, creation is not at rest. It's in the minor key, and there's groaning and there's moaning, and that's scientifically spoken. That's not Rochelle saying this. But yes, there, there is a, a, a rest yet to come. It is a greater rest. We enter into that rest, we know, through our salvation. But yes, I believe that when we've come to what we'll call eternity future, we've come through all the rest, we're in Revelation 22, everything else has passed, that is where I believe there will be, a, and no, I don't believe this literally, but the thought, there will be that huge, it's where it belongs, it's the way God wants it, it's the way that glorifies Him forever. Oh, Doris says, I need to close this out in prayer so she can go and others who need to also. Rowena, did you want to say something real quick first? No, um, when you were discussing all about the senses of God, you know, he can see, he can talk, he can touch. Mm -hmm. For probably an unbeliever, they would just look at it as like it's a metaphor, you know. And mm -hmm. mm -hmm. But when you were discussing everything, what just went into my mind was God is omniscient. That's why. He knows what it is to smell. He knows yes. what it is to talk and to touch. Yes. And so and then that's what he brought to us. <laughs> yeah. And and you know each one of those is so important to life. Uh, we worked with a little girl that had no feeling. She could not. You could touch her skin. She could not feel it. It's a disease. And at first you say, Oh wow, she can never hurt. There's no pain. But for this little girl, she can hurt herself and never know. So she'd go out to play, and when she'd come back in, her mom would have to check her from head to toe and make sure there was nothing, a stubbed toe, you know, anything that needed treatment and care to be taken care of. It really isn't good to not have touch, to not feel. Plus, she'll never know the joy of the feel of a hug, you know, and the love until she's home and have it. Every sense that God's given us, not one of them do I want to be devoid of. You know, I want to hear, I want to see, I want to taste, I want to touch, I want to feel, you know. 
but it amazes me how, you know, and then there's nothing else. I can't say, oh, I wish God had given me <laughs> fill in the blank, you know? <laughs> he made us with everything we need. He, he's amazing. Yeah. I got to close. Another, another, Go ahead. In other words, we are a limited creation. Yes. God. Yes. Yeah. Limited edition. I was thinking limited edition, <laughs> but that sounds like there'll be another, so I think we got to stick with limited creation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the limited edition decays. Yeah. Right. 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 Yeah. But I'm so thankful he's given us the ability to begin to to touch what's his and what he is in that relationship. And, and just wait, just wait, because you're all over things. I'm going to show you the tabernacle with creation. That's amazing. I'm going to show you more about the rest than what Anne did bring out. I love what Anne did do, and you did go another area different than, than what I was thinking. Uh, but there's so much in all of that, too, that, that God has blessed us with. It's just phenomenal, just phenomenal. And all to help us be able to relate to him. You know, if he didn't, we couldn't begin to put a face on God. We couldn't begin to touch and understand. We couldn't, you know, it, it just... I think I just saw that they wanted the room. <laughs> I think God's saying, okay, you know, we'll talk about this for all of eternity and, and not run out of things to say about it. <laughs> and I still say we're going to be up there going, wow, we thought we knew something. What little did we know? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, let's go ahead you can keep talking let me close a prayer so Dora can run Roger can start packing up things but we'll keep Zoom open until they either kick us out or you all go <laughs> okay Lord God thank you thank you for loving us so to relate to us to make us so you can relate to us to bring us into this special relationship that you didn't give to anything else you created you gave it to us you didn't even give it to the angels who are right there in your presence now. They don't know you in the way that we're allowed to. Lord, we're, we're so honored. We are so privileged. We are so enamored. We are so befuddled in our little human minds, but our hearts are, are doing leaps and jumps and hallelujahs and praises and can only wait till it is literally what our... Our presence is that we are in your presence in your home forever and ever and ever and thank you that we know that day is coming thank you for giving us glimpses thank you for loving us enough to save us when we did nothing to deserve it thank you for being who you are we we'll praise you forever and ever and ever amen amen Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. After conversation has been great. Love you all. Lord bless you all. Where do I put it where you can see it? Up here. <laughs> Shalom to all. See you tomorrow, next week, Saturday, Friday, whenever. <laughs>